Roman Ayastala, I'm the author of The Debugging Book, and I'm here to present you a new chapter. If you are a big uh, software company that manufactures, say, operating systems for PCs, and if you have set up your operating system such that every time any application on your system, uh, such, such, such that whenever any user in the world has an application that crashes, and this is automatically sent back to you, you will get very many, very, very many of such crash reports, even if there's just one, if, even if there's just one crash per week per user, uh, you simply have so many users that your database will be absolutely flooded. And um, units like, uh, say, uh, bug reports per second are totally, are, are not the correct units to describe the flow, the, 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 the flood of crash reports that you get. And yes, all the, all, all the time, all the time, there's all, all the time there is some third party application crashing somewhere. Of course, it's never your own, it's never your own product. Did anyone ever have had, did anyone ever have a, have a true genuine Microsoft, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that, uh, a, a US vendor uh, product crashing on, um, no, uh, nobody ever, okay, good. So, also, also a bit of information. You can get plenty of data this way. And since we're talking about data that we are getting through bug reports, let me get you to the second chapter for today. So we have seen how to collect bug data in databases which is an essential prerequisite for organizing the debugging process. And of course, as good developers, you know that a version database is absolutely crucial for organizing your daily work such that no change gets lost. Which means that you do have information about changes in your database, you have information about bugs in your database, you may have even more such as um, such as uh, interactions between developers as they talk about how to fix specific bugs, interactions with users and everything. And uh, at some point, the question arises, can you go and um, actually mine such information from your databases in order to, in order to get some insights? And uh, for this last chapter of the book, I have prepared something for you. And this is, a, this, is a, this is a mechanism that allows you to count the changes in a particular uh, Git repository and visualize these. And since this takes a few minutes to execute, I already have started it. This is what such a visualization looks like. So this is actually the debugging book project in here. And what you see here is a tree map representation. And this tree map representation consists of nested uh, rectangles, where each rectangle stands for a directory, and the filled rectangles stand for, the filled rectangles stand for files. So what we have here is the debugging book repository. So that's not too exciting, and in here you have a folder or directory called notebooks, and in this notebooks folder you do have a couple of well, <laughs> not very surprising notebooks. These are the chapters of the book. What we have here is, uh, is the chapter on assertions. We have the chapter on dynamic invariants. We have the chapter on interactive debuggers and likewise. Actually, all of these are organized by size. So the largest one seems to be the slicer in here. And one of the smaller ones is huh, the class diagram part, the release notes, all these are not very big. And the color of these rectangles indicates the number of changes they have been going through. So here, for instance, we have uh, the chapter on slicing. This is a very big step. This is a very big and complex chapter. This has seen no less than 110 commits until it was ready. That's what, that, that's what, that's what I'm working on, doing one commit after the other, adding feature after feature and fixing bug after bug. The chapter on automatic repair, which you also have seen, also is one of the also is one of the most uh, is also one of the most um, say frequently changed ones. 
And there's also this other, such as Change Counter, which is this very chapter. This has only seen four comments so far, uh, simply because, well, it's all new and there, has, there haven't been that many, that many changes to it. By, and how does this work? Um, this works actually by running, uh, this actually works by running a flurry of Git commands on the Git database, which extract the entire change history for each and every component. So for every slicer dot, yeah, for every, including all the files, including all the, including all the notebooks. And then it simply counts how many changes were made to a particular, to, to a particular chapter. Um, <clears throat> the details on this are of course in the book, but what you also can do is, and that's actually just four lines of code, you can also go and say, okay, I'm not only interested in changes, I'm interested in fixes. Because changes, you know, one change, another change, another change, it depends. Some people try to, some people tend to block all their changes in one single chunk. Others do micro changes for every single little feature they add, they make another commit. But fixes are interesting because fixes give you an idea on how many bugs there are in a component because obviously the more bugs they have been in a component, the more frequently these were fixed. So here I have another visualization, which also gives us uh, the individual notebooks, but now it's actually telling us how many fixes were made. And for the debugging book, this is actually pretty simple because um, if in the debugging book, this is my own discipline, if a commit message to the version database starts with the word fix, then it is a fix. Other better techniques may be to actually look for bug numbers and to see whether a commit contains a bug number that is actually also an entry in the bug database. This is far more sophisticated. Here we go for something that is very project specific. And uh, we can actually look this up and here's the, and <clears throat> this actually shows not only the, not only the, not the number of fixes, but actually lists the individual fixes. What have we had here? Adjust line numbers for external functions didn't work properly. Spurious data dependencies, better color locations, handle case when all is untracked, missing cells, support for generators, string and num wouldn't work when imported. Boom. Yep, all of these were individual bugs that had to be fixed at some point. And this is how we can look them up, whatever happened here. This is actually the darkest slicer because this is the most complex one. I guess this should be repair. No, it's statistical debugger. Statistical debugger has seen the second most bugs in the, in the project. So uh, when importing line numbers were off by one, I am sure that this is something that Constantin has found and Constantin has fixed. And I also fixed it then in the statistical debugging. Fix bad you. Fix debugger only worked in notebook. You cannot use it in Python code outside of the notebook. Code with coverage was failing. Oh, fix missing comma. Oh, I missed a comma. Is that a missing comma in the text or is it a missing comma in the code? Well, in, <clears throat> well uh, up for us to actually analyze all this. And this is how we can go and um, this is how we can go and find out not only um, which parts were changed, but we can also find out which change, which parts were fixed most often. Now you can think, um, what does it mean if a component was fixed frequently? Does that mean that all bugs are fixed now? Or does that mean that there are more bugs? Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the sad reality is that if a component was fixed frequently in the past, chances are that it's going to be fixed frequently in the future too. It's like fishing. You go to a spot where you find plenty of fish and lo and behold, there's plenty of fish to fish to catch. And the next morning you come back to the same spot, it turns out that the fishes still like to go there and so you can find more fishes there. Except that for fishes, we do have a good theory on how they reproduce. We don't have such a similar we don't have such a theory for bugs. But the important thing to remember is that bugs and the, and the number of bugs that you find is very much dependent on the environment. So there are tasks in your environment or which simply have a big complexity inherently from the very beginning. Slicing 
is complex. Whereas, for instance, what do we have here? Writing an appendix is not very complex, okay? Or what do we have here? An index time travel debugger. Huh? It was simple. They were just reducing code. Invariants. Invariants were not, invariants apparently were not very complicated either, okay? But building a slicer is inherently complex. So simply by writing lots of code on in a, in a, for complex requirements, you will have many bugs. And then there's also requirements which change frequently. Um, <laughs> again, um, while I was working, while I was working with big software companies, there were components which were which which were essentially changing every single week or so, simply because um, simply because the requirements had changed again, or the requirements were unstable. And even if you, from your side, think that the requirements are stable, this does not necessarily hold for your for for the other folks whom you work with. Uh, it may even be that you have to work around the bugs that they create, which means that you're going to have even more fixes in your part of the code. If you consider, say again, large operating systems, for instance, you will find that there's hotspots which get fixed all over the place again and again, partly because they are super complex, but also partly because the requirements and the associated hardware change all the time. We have done similar mappings like these for uh, Firefox. And for Firefox, this is some time ago, we tracked which uh, components in the code had the most security issues. And it turned out that, of course, JavaScript was the one component with the, by far most security issues because, well, JavaScript is complex. We have just-in-time compiling, which is very, very nasty to debug, very, very nasty to properly test. So no wonder these were, this were, these were the parts where we had the most security issues. But there were other parts which also were listed in orange in a map like this. And these were also parts which maybe were not so much on the radar, also not so much on the radar of managers, and who would always be very, very happy when we would point them to uh, components that actually also had seen quite a number of bugs in the past. Actually, this uh, module is pretty generic. Um, all you can you can actually run this on any Git repository. Um, if you run this on a project which is larger than the than, than the debugging book, you're going to see. Well, you will have to wait for several minutes until you get a nice tree map out of this, but. Run this on a project of your own and find out where the most changes are. And if you can easily identify fixes from changes, then you can also find out where the most fixes are. As an added bonus, we're having an extra part in here because so far we only talked about those files that were most bug prone. Um, but what you also can do is you can break down the files into individual elements. That is, for instance, individual classes and functions and methods. So individual parts that are named in your code. And <clears throat> this is something we have done here. And then again, we have broken down the changes into individual parts. So what you see here, let's take a look again at the slicer class in here. Let's see which parts were most frequently changed. And you can see that in the slicer, in the slicer notebook, the slicer class has seen the most changes, namely seven, dependency tracker with four, dependencies with two, tint, t int. This is not even there anymore in the current slicer version, but it had also seen one change. And we have the middle function, which has seen two changes, and access transformer, which has seen one change. So uh, you can also go and uh, go for individual parts in here. So here we have reducing code. Dynamic invariance is really, really large. So you can see that, oops, sorry, I think we went one too far in here. So you can see that um, there's also been quite a number of changes that have been distributed all across, all, across the, um, all across the module or all across the chapter that is. You can also go and look for individual parts in repairer. So this again gives you a view on how to look at and how to look at individual on how to look at uh, individual components that are even more fine grained than uh, that are even more fine grained than what you would, that what you find if you're looking at only large files. Um, this is also something. So the breakdown of um, of modules into individual parts 
comes with a couple of regular expressions that work well for Jupyter Notebooks, for um, Python, for uh, C programs, and actually anything that looks like a C program. So as long as, it is, as, as, long as people use curly braces, there is a good chance of it being able to, um, to break things down into smaller parts. And there again, you can adapt this to your own code and find out where the most changes and possibly even where the most fixes were made. And the whole thing comes as an SVG, so you can actually send this out. You can even send this, this is part of HTML. You can even send this out in an email, send this out to your manager and tell your manager, hey, this is where the most changes are. Um, with that, a small word of caution. So all this data can also give uh, rise to misinterpretations. In particular, if you go and bring individual developers into play. So what you also can find out for all of these for all, all of these changes and fixes is which developer actually has worked on them. And you may be tempted to you may be tempted to find out which developers have made the most fixes and possibly therefore have made the most bugs. You can also come up with metrics that tell you how many lines of code were changed per individual developers, and then you can come up with ranked lists of um, with ranked lists of developers by their so-called productivity or or inverse ranking by the how many bugs they made, okay, or how or even how bug prone their components are, and make this a metric. Okay, I would extremely advise um, advise against doing such investigations. First, if you go and measure the performance of people by these metrics, people are going to behave in a way that they will fulfill these metrics. That is, um, if I am being judged by the number of bugs I fix, I will fix, I, I will go and fix zillions of bugs. Very simple, pay me $1 per bugs I fix and next morning I'll come up with 10,000 bugs which are found and fixed. If only, if only, if only the, the tiniest one. The color was red, but it should be blue. Oh, and then the blue color was blue, but it should be red. Oh, and then it should be blue again. I can change it. I can change things back and forth and fill up the database with plenty of whatever requests, okay? So none of this makes sense. The second thing is, and that's uh, more important, um, <laughs> Um, these numbers, what, what you find, can also be very misleading. Um, I, well, I, my student Tom Zimmerman and myself, we were among the very first to mine such change and bug databases. And um, at the time, we were looking, among others, into the bug database of um, into the bug database of Eclipse. You know, Eclipse, the big uh, programming environment for Java and other languages. And uh, we took a look into who made the most changes that later had to be fixed. So who wrote the most code which later had to be fixed again? Or to put it very close, very shortly, who wrote the most buggy code? Well. It turned out that the person who wrote the most buggy code was no one else but Erich Gamma himself. Erich Gamma, the creator of Eclipse. Erich Gamma, the inventor of design patterns or co-inventor. Erich Gamma, the co-inventor of unit testing. Yes, the, a, a living legend, see? He was the one who wrote the buggiest code in Eclipse. So we had lots of fun when we found that out. Oh, the big Irish Gamma writes code which has to be fixed again and again. Well, <laughs> we talked to him. <laughs> we talked to him, and this is what he told us. Um, he told us that, um, see, there's the Eclipse team, and there's a hierarchy in there. Erich is at the top, and there, there, there are his minions, and there's more minions and sub minions and everything. Okay, and here comes somebody. Here's somebody who works on a bug database at some point in the morning. Somebody down in the hierarchy and finds here's a bug. Oh, this is a super complex thing. I cannot touch this, and I'm not going to touch this. I am going to reassign this bug to my boss because my boss has more expertise than I am. And then this boss 
finds out, oh, this is super complex. I don't want to touch this code. I'm going to give this to my boss. And then this goes up the, this goes up the hierarchy until it ends up with the single person who has no boss anymore that uh, this could actually be, that this bug could be reassigned to. And this person who is at the very top happens to be Erich Gamma. And no, he cannot go and assign this to someone else. Somebody has to work on this super complex and super risky and super brutal thing. And it should be the person with the most experience overall and somebody who actually knows it all and this is Erich. And still the risk of breaking things is far too high. And this is why all the complex bugs end up with Erich Gamma, and all the simple bugs were already all fixed at the lower levels. Same goes if you're working, same, this, is, this is the same thing in industry. The more competent you are, the more difficult, or the higher you rise in the hierarchy, the more difficult the decisions you have to work on, because the simple decisions are already all being, being taken care of. So, and before you go and find out that your boss is actually the one who makes the most mistakes. Also keep in mind that your boss may actually be the one who actually is the one who risks, who actually, who actually dares going into all these parts because um, such, uh, such complicated assignments may not end up with you at all. Okay, so far, so this was a bit about, um, this was a bit about um, mining such bug and change databases. So whereas uh, the chapter on bug databases has no code to execute or to work with, uh, the chapter on um, mining databases has plenty of opportunities to work with, to toy with. And I would very much encourage you to try this out yourself on your own database. And if you like what you're seeing, there's a whole world of research and also uh, quite, uh, quite some world now of uh, commercial tools that allow you to explore such back databases, to visualize them. And yes, there is quite a lot to learn about individual projects. Thank you very much and enjoy. And I'm happy to take questions. So Johannes, Konstantin, uh, any questions from your side, anything in the chat, anything in the question and answer window? Um, no. Not really. No questions. Are you all happy? Yes. So far, nothing in the Q and A window. Okay. Well, actually, I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> so, when we have a long list of issues, mm -hmm. or even a long list of fixes afterwards, mm -hmm. so how to understand which ones are important and which ones are minor? Because even uh, from what you have shown us, yeah, some fixes are just a comma, mm -hmm. but others yes. are about critical parts of the system. So yes. any comment on the prioritization <laughs> of things? Yes. So, um, so if you only have the change history, there's, there's typically not going to be too much meta information about why you made that change or about why you made that change or which issue this is actually related to. This is why good uh, development practices mandate that if you do a commit, you should put in a bug number into your commit message, which then relates to the appropriate issue in the bug database. And this is where you can then find additional meta information, such as the description of the bug and how serious it is, whether this was a major bug, a minor bug, an enhancement, or likewise, okay? So this gives you then extra information and uh, you would typically be well advised not to, well, to, for instance, to make a strong distinction between bugs and features, because um, if a feature was added in a particular place, what does this tell you about this particular place? Not much, but if a, but if a bug was fixed, in particular, if a bug was fixed after the um, project went into production, that's of course a far more important issue and that's something you may want to minimize over time. Having said that, um, not all the information you find in real bug databases, it can be totally, can be totally uh, relied upon. Because for instance, when I say you need to differentiate between bugs and features, um, we have done a study, uh, this is 
uh, several years ago, I think seven years ago, we did that. Uh, we have made a study uh, by uh, Kim Hatzik, my PhD student. Um, he has gone through thousands and thousands of bug reports and manually classified them and found out that many bug reports that are listed as bugs were actually features and vice versa, which means that, um, and, and that's one thing. And second thing is, uh, depending on the discipline in your project, not every commit message may have the appropriate bug numbers in there. It uh, always depends on, it always depends on, uh, on the discipline of your coworkers and how much he, your coworkers see or have the insight that later on an analysis of this data is going to point out how to improve how to improve the development process. But if you give tools like these, like this tree map to developers and make them find out who oh, these are, this is where the bugs are, that's very interesting. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you create tools like these and, and then show developers how much of their discipline in writing a commit message is required to make these things work, um, then um, you get more, then, then you get a high, uh, somewhat higher rigor in your data collection. And then you, have, you also have better ways to actually, uh, to actually make all of this data sing. Having said that, um, you're always advised to do a manual inspection of the data before figuring out how, how reliable it is before you go and, uh, before you go and uh, uh, create an analysis out of it. And in particular before, and in particular you should very much do that before you take, you draw any consequences out of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for- Does it answer your question? Okay. Yes. Good. Okay, Johannes, anything to add from your side? No. <laughs> Any best practices for commit messages for bug databases? Something that bugs you all the time? There, there are lots of things, especially if, if um, you don't describe the bug well or just say it doesn't work, it just doesn't work okay, but what was... Um, the circumstances under which it didn't work, mm -hmm. um, and if you if you cannot replicate it, or if you don't even know what the environment was and how to replicate it, it's it's super hard to mm -hmm. to even figure out what could be wrong. Um, yep. So this is something I hate to see. So this doesn't work. Okay. Yep. Believe it or not, I once got a bug report. This was for GNU DDD, which is also a debugger for that matter. Um, I got a bug report that simply says um, your debugger crashes. Period. Yep. These three words were the entirety of the bug report that <laughs> said, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to fix this immediately because here I am having my whatever uh, 50,000 lines of C++ code and somewhere in there it crashes. And of course, I mean, I'm a genius. I can immediately see when it crashes and why it crashed and everything. And, yeah, sure. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes it's actually not that easy to create this bug report without revealing some sensitive data, right? Yeah. As I said before, if my browser crashes on Pornhub and only on Pornhub, it's <laughs> It's not, definitely, it's not definitely something I'd like to tell a random developer, nor does a developer want to know about the specifics of which pages on Pornhub I'm actually looking at. This doesn't work. Um, some, something that can help a lot with that, and, um, and, that's actually, that, and, it's, and it's actually being used for that, is Delta debugging. Because you have Delta debugging, which actually takes an entire page, say, such as a web page with everything, and automatically reduces it to the minimum that is required. And then um, even a web page like Pornhub uh, is going to be reduced to an absolute minimum, which has nothing to do with porn anymore. And then there will be just those elements left in there, the JavaScript elements or whatsoever that actually cause the bug. And this is, for, from, from my perspective, far less sensitive to send around. And at the same time, it generalizes the bug and it also, um, and it also makes it far easier to determine duplicates because if you have a minimal bug report, uh, minimized input, 
uh, then you can actually then um, it makes it easier to find out whether those features that are contained in this bug report actually are also contained in other bug reports. This is actually where delta debugging is being used in practice to find out where uh, duplicates are in order to find out which parts of an input are actually relevant. But yes, um, but but this is actually, but but you know, this is all, well, when I'm reporting a bug, I'm going through all these steps because I have an idea of the developer who's sitting on the other side of the fence. But for laymen, none of this works in any way. <laughs> laymen are going to tell you that they have this, that they have this uh, space gray laptop with a blue desktop background on which they have uh, on, on which they have they are running uh, on which they are among others uh, running some WhatsApp thingy, but which has nothing to do with the error, I guess, or all sorts of details, and it goes down and trickles down and trickles down, and the one information that you actually want is is not contained in there. But but laymen do not have an, do not have a, a sense for which parts of their environment may be relevant for uh, producing a bug. And actually, who knows, maybe the, maybe the desktop color matters. Maybe your program crashes only on a blue desktop, on a blue screen, that is. Ha. Possible, possible. I mean, apparently, Zoom, as we have seen today, Zoom screen sharing doesn't work under certain circumstances. Care to find out why? Who knows? Is it, do I have enough information to send a bug report? No. Should I send a bug report to Zoom that uh, sharing screen sometimes doesn't work? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's like your program crashes. OK, I think that we already have extended our time a bit for today, or at least we are close to the maximum of 90 minutes. Any further questions? Konstantin, Johannes, something from the audience? No, still no questions from the audience. Okay, what do we have here? See, we have a link here. Windows Windows 10 bug crashes your PC when you access this location. Why on earth should I click on exactly this bug? Oh, I'm not running Windows 10. Oh, good. Good thing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep that for I'm going to keep that for the attendees to, to click on and to see whether things work. Okay, folks. Um, that's it for today. A bit of a bit of um, introduction into the wonderful world of using and mining bug and version databases. As I said, there's a there's a whole flurry of research around all this because simply there is so much data that is available, and there's there can be quite some fun in data mining, and it has real world consequences. So there's plenty of fun in there too. Uh, if you want to enjoy, if you want to toy with the visualization means that are included in the book, and uh, go and find out what your own project looks like. Thank you very much for your attention, and see all of you next week. Bye bye.